Thank you. Calling tonight to order um, Thursday, May 2nd. It is Scarborough School Board um, business meeting. Apologize for the delay. Had a little technical things and a couple of changes. Um, can I have the attendance for tonight, please? Yes. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Mrs. Glidden? Here. Mr. Gill? Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Mr. Hinton? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. Thank you. If you could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There is one adjustment to tonight's agenda. We're moving 10.0 new business up underneath public comments, so it'll become the new 6.0. Okay. Are there any public comments to tonight's agenda? Okay, seeing none, that's closed. 6.0 new business. First reading of our graduation policy, IKF. Okay. Um, we are going to just kind of talk you guys through the process that we went through to get this to the point where we're ready to do a first reading. We'll talk about key decisions and then um, give you just a little bit more information about the policy. Uh, we, I want to talk about the process first because I, I think that um, it's crucial for the community to understand that um, this was started and we've been working on this since about March 6 when members of the policy committee met with several members of ILT, Principal Ketch and Malnique Culperson and we were there to gar garner feedback about what direction um, the high school would like to take in terms of the graduation requirements. Then on March 11th, we had a policy committee meeting that was held at the high school. We invited all high school staff to a forum where they could speak to us about their hopes for the graduation policy. We followed that up with an ILT meeting with, that also included district leadership. Then on April 8th, we met um, as a policy committee in council chambers and we, we had an invite that we sent to the community to allow them um, an opportunity to come in and hear our work or, or make public comment about our work. Um, I just want to also say that all involved um, have worked really thoughtfully to develop a sound policy that values local control and all allows Scarborough to continue to provide a strong academic high school program which includes multiple pathways and opportunities for all students. And we, um, at the heart of our work, we looked at Title 20 um, and the new law that was, that was um, voted on this past summer, which gave local control back and determined that each district could decide whether to, to accept a, expect a proficiency or a credit-based diploma. Amy, the only piece I would add to the process was our Every Student Graduates Committee, um, formerly known as a Dropout Prevention Committee, also reviewed the policy and suggestions came forward through the high school principal and district leadership right. as well. Thank you. Yeah. So key decisions. Um, we decided to solidify Skyro's graduation requirements to be based on credits. Um, we decided to keep the class of 2020 credits re credit requirement at 21, which is, cur which is currently in the policy. We changed the minimum required number of credits from 24 to 22 for the class of 2021 and beyond. We removed the wording of educational experiences and instead now use courses and credits. We removed the word proficiency and, and instead reflect a standard-based credit system. Remove the personal learning plan requirement to allow flexibility for high school staff as they work on the standards curriculum maps and developing the K through 12 curriculum guide. Allow for multiple pathways and opportunities um, and make those, make lots of options available for those pathways and opportunities. Expect that all students have demonstrated progress in the guiding principles upon successful course completion, which will be a fluid process because we all agreed that we're really never done working on those guiding principles, that we're always making progress towards those guiding principles and the work that students do in the classroom reflect that. And also to promote accessibility for students interested in vocational school and also students receiving special services. So in terms of the multiple pathways and opportunities, um, this, this is already in our policy, um, but we um, 
reworked it a little bit and said that Scarborough High School offers all students multiple learning options that allow students to demonstrate achievement on expected learning standards, earn academic credit, and satisfy graduation requirements. Um, there's a list of, of op options there. Um, academic course offerings in the school, obviously, dual enrollment, early college courses. I learned recently that I think 22 students are taking um, classes at USM this year, I think. I don't remember the exact number off the but, top of my head. But quite, quite a few, exactly. for sure. Um, career and technical education and programming, uh, perhaps an opportunity for students um, you know, through the flexibility of the high school as they develop this, um, if they needed to earn a math or science credit through vocational school, they would have the opportunity to do so. Online or blended learning options, alternative or at-risk programming, apprenti apprentice apprenticeships, internships, field work, exchange experiences, independent studies and long-term projects, as well as adult education. And again, um, the course requirements, the credit requirements here, English four years, remove social studies and math and science um, from four credits to three credits, fine arts, one credit, health, a half a credit, phys ed, one credit, technology, half a credit, and then a minimum of six elective credits. Thank you. Yep. Um, on behalf of the whole policy committee, I really do want to thank the teachers your work on this has been incredible. Lots of late afternoons, late evenings. Your support of us has been greatly appreciated as we rework the policy. Um, and the commitment to the students is commendable. Thank you so much. Um, that said, is there a motion to accept the policy as written so for a first reading? Second. Any discussion? Is this the time to ask questions? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, um, how will the changes in these requirements affect the work that the teachers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Can you clarify that a little bit more? What do you mean? I just mean that um, there's been so many things that we've done recently that has extra work or has required changes in the type of work that they're doing, grading or what, what, whatever that is. Um, I'm wondering if this puts an additional burden to make extra changes on their day to day. I don't, I don't foresee any burden on them. I think it creates an incredible amount of flexibility for them to do the work that they indicated in these meetings that they were already doing in terms of them, they're really working hard right now on the, on the curriculum maps and you know, what that looks like, what guiding principles are being worked on in, in each course. Um, so I don't see it as an additional burden. I think that, and I think we heard clearly from them that this would create a lot of flexibility for them to continue the work that they're doing in the district. Okay. That was my question, that, thank you. Actually, I have another question if anyone else. Um, so I'm just looking up here right now. Can you talk to, to uh, can you speak to the decision to take um, the credit or a year, I guess a credit or a year away from social studies, math and science and leaving English? Sure. Um, I don't know if, if I think Sue might be better served to speak to that. Um. So traditionally, for many, many years now, <clears throat> the credit requirements have been four years of English, three of math, social studies, and science. And really, um, by and large, many, 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 many of our students do four years of each as part of their preparation. One of the things that came up in the Every, Every Student Graduates Committee was we, want, we know that our high flyers are going to achieve well above the minimum required credits because they have such incentive for what they want to be doing. But what we also really wanted to do was be welcoming and nurturing to students that have a harder time in school and may not pass every course first time around and we didn't want the requirements to be so high that you have to pass six courses every year that then they might get discouraged. And so we looked at that overall and brought them back to what they have been in the past. And we did add that one credit, Kristen's idea she brought forward, that um, in adding the um, 
the new schedule where they now have eight course options a year that we did think raising the electives one credit over the four years would be a way of expanding that a little bit but not an overburden for students that will have a little bit harder time getting their credits so that that is five currently and it's <coughs> yes the electives is six. this year for juniors and seniors before any of the changes started was five and we have moved that up to six also talk to the limitations for our students who choose to attend career technical mm -hmm. education centers with the 24 credits so um, one of our concerns was that when we were at 4444 um, was that for students going to a vocational program um, that would start their junior year in order to continue with those four core classes for two years and match that with the four periods that they're at VOC they really would have to have had a completely successful first two years would have had to complete their fine arts their health their pe and technology all of that would have to be in place to be able to do their junior and senior year with four periods of core and four periods of vote and so again we just worried that for some of those students that are real hands-on learners they might have had a struggle in the first two years which would make it really hard to engage in those programs their final two years. And the other thing I would add to that is that um, there's a big movement to kind of rebrand and destigmatize career technical education and really moving away from it being just a vocational program for students who are not considering college to it being a more career technical education experience on your way to postgraduate work um, and or college. And so we know all of these decisions are also backed by data. We know that there are students currently who might be um, interested in careers in the health fields um, and are not accessing career technical ed right now because of um, the, the way the scheduling is or the way the scheduling was. If they had to have 444 all the way down, they wouldn't be able to manage both because of the, the timing of our schedules. Aren't, they're not perfectly aligned. Um, so they don't have as much access. <laughs> And the, the other piece, too, um, that, we, that we talked about was um, being able to, as we keep the policy flexible enough so that as we um, continue our curriculum work and aligning it to the standards and as the um, career technical ed centers do that as well, you know, really could there be a way for students to earn a math or a science or even an English or social studies credit um, by, you know, in, in their attendance and the coursework that they're doing at those career technical ed centers. Again, trying to promote that and have more students um, access that real hands-on relevant um, experience that, that the career technical ed centers offer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Any other questions? A um, couple of quick things. One, this is probably gonna look a little different, especially for the folks at home. Usually we have read the policies and we have highlighted the changes. We're piloting something a little different. We sent out the policies in advance to the entire board to read. They're posted online in the website um, so that people could have a chance to read them and, uh, and absorb them rather than hearing somebody read it and try and put it all together. Um, for the folks at home, if they're looking at the numbers, because I know we had mentioned both 21 and 22 credits, um, just as a reminder, the 22 credits are for our current sophomores going to be juniors next year for the class of 2021 forward um it's still 21 for this year and just as a last thank you to our administrators thank you for opening the door to the high school to let us in monique thank you for all the time that you spent with us as well in getting this together and of course julie and joanne um if there's no other comments i'd like to vote on our first reading all those in favor so moved and Leanne, just for um, folks interested, could you clarify when the second reading will be? Yes, the second reading is going to be at our next meeting on the 16th, um, and that is to ensure that we can get the handbooks updated and be prepared for next year's graduation, that everything is all set with the new graduation requirements. Okay. Going into 10.2, the first reading of our policy um, for students with allergies and sensitivities, also known as JLCEA. Um, this one, the committee had, we had brought this forward um, in February and decided to take it back, um, reworked it, meeting with our nurses and the administration. 
and we created a new policy that supports the protocols that were written. Um, there are very in-depth uh, protocols that are in place, but we made sure that we had a policy and protocol that supported the students that had those needs. Um, and again, just making sure that we, in this pilot process, for the parents who had reached out to us and had concerns about the removal or what the protocols meant, how is this going to impact their children, we proactively emailed the policy and the protocol to them to read them in advance as well as posting them on the websites. Um, again, a lot of work went into that and I appreciate everybody's input on getting that to a place where I think we feel very comfortable in bringing this forward for the first reading. Um, and with that, is there a motion to accept the first reading of the students with diagnosed allergies and sensitivities for a first read? So moved. Second. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Excellent, so moved, thank you. And then the last of the new business is the middle school girls lacrosse assistant coach. The recommendation is to appoint Maddie York as the middle school girls assistant lacrosse coach to be funded through the general fund. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? So moved. Thank you. Okay. Moving back to 7.0, the superintendent's report. So to all of our teachers who came tonight, you're welcome to stay through the superintendent's report and the presentation, or you may also choose to leave at this time so you can rest up for tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for Thank coming. You for Thank, coming. You. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. What's tomorrow? Friday. Work. Work. That is a special day. Rest up extra hard. We need them fresh for Friday. Administrators, of course, you have the same choice. <laughs> All right, thanks for hanging in, everyone else. Um, the first thing in my report is just the monthly enrollment update. It's May 2nd, so we're looking at our May 1st enrollment numbers. Um, and again, this is, can be misleading at times when you look at overall numbers. Um, and I'll just highlight one example. So to, collectively, we are down one student overall this month. Um, but I uh, was digging into some of the enrollment data at Wentworth School particularly, because I noticed when I looked from August to April, there was a 25, we, an increase in 25 students. But then as I talked to Principal Crosby about it, um, and she worked with some of her staff, we actually learned that from the beginning of the school year till now, we've had 55 new students at Wentworth. Um, and I think now officially 15 who have moved out. So um, those numbers, again, it's, you know, we're, it's a static number. We're looking at it at these various points in times, but a lot of things can happen in between even my monthly update for you. Um, so we continue to watch this closely. We look at it in aggregate, um, but then we also disaggregate the numbers and we um, try to identify trends and um, really use it particularly this time of year as we're planning for the budget um, and the staffing needs for next year. Again, for those who might be seeing this for the first time, the, the two middle columns here, the 2016, obviously, um, that's our older enrollment study. So now we're curious to see how our new enrollment study is playing out comparative to the older study. And um, if you've been filing enrollment um, like we have, you know that we were not using this number ever because we knew that it was not um, going to align with Scarborough's growth. We've been using this new housing projections. And now um, our Long Range Planning Committee has, um, has selected to use this best fit model plus high multifamily impact is what MFI stands for. And so when you take a moment and just look across, you can see that our new study is um, fairly accurate, plus or minus a few kids. Um, and so uh, we feel really confident using those numbers as we're making our budget projections going into the school year. Um, and we'll continue to watch it. 
The next item, I'd like to invite our Director of Curriculum and Assessment, Monique Culbertson, and our Improvement Strategist, Kathy Terrell, to the podium. They're really going to give you two um, critical and timely presentations tonight that I'm sure they'll introduce to you, but they'll be talking about our comprehensive needs assessment process. This is a process we're really proud of as we strive to be in um, a school system that's continuously improving. And then they'll also talk about the Every, Stu Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the replacement for No Child Left Behind, um, and the grants that we are eligible for. And this will serve as our public notice of um, that process, which I'm sure Monique and Kathy will go into. Hi, I'm Kathy Terrell. I'm the Improvement Strategist. And I'll be sharing our progress on the Comprehensive Needs Assessment. And Monique Culbertson will be sharing an orientation to the Every Student Succeeds grants. So each public school in Maine must complete a Comprehensive Needs Assessment, the CNA, in order to receive federal funds. In Scarborough, we want this to be more than just a compliance exercise. So this work has become our district improvement process, and we're using data-wise resources and protocols to guide the work. Our focus is our students, and that's why we do this, and our vision is to ensure continuous improvement for all students, staff, and administrators. So the purpose of the CNA is to inform our district improvement process and our document reflects the school's current states, practices, and functionalities. It creates a clear plan, including the school's current areas of strengths, areas for improvement, and our action steps. And it creates a purposeful and meaningful approach to leverage our state, local, and federal funding and inform data-driven decisions. So our um, Scarborough's Comprehensive Needs Assessment was submitted to the state last year, and it will be submitted again in the summer of 2023. Seems a long ways away, but even though our CNA is submitted to the state every five years, it's meant to be a living document that is updated each year. Therefore, we scheduled three meetings for our CNA community team this year. Um, we also wanted to expand our team, so we invited parents, community members, and students to join us. So we now have 12 parents, six community members, five high school students, eight teachers, a school board member, seven school administrators, and four district administrators on the team. Um, so at our first CNA community meeting, um, it was an orientation to the plan. We reviewed data by school and district. We identified noticings and wonderings for each section. Then we had our second meeting on March 12th, and we reviewed those noticings and wonderings, and then we identified strengths and areas for improvement. Today's um, school board meeting, we're going, giving you the progress on the CNA, and then an orientation to the ESSA grants. May 7th at our Leadership Council meeting, we're going to be um, reviewing the process and the work to date, and th that will include the strengths and areas of improvement identified by the CNA um, committee. And then we'll be reviewing and updating our focus areas based on evidence, and we'll be aligning our resources um, to both local and ESSA. On May 28th, we'll have our third CNA community meeting, and at that time, we'll share the Leadership Council's draft of the focus areas under consideration, and then also the alignment to the proposed budget. We're also going to um, talk about our initial thoughts on the ESSA funding and um, public input. Then on June 11th, um, We'll have our Leadership Council meeting, and we will develop our progress update on our building and district goals that are in the CNA, and finalize our ESSA um, project proposals. Then on June 20th, we're coming back to the school board meeting again and sharing the district progress and the update on the CNA, our district and building goals, and we'll also share those ESSA project proposals.
So one of the things that we do as we look at these focus areas is we're trying to maximize our resources, get as much value for every dollar, whether it comes from state, federal funding, or local dollars um, <clears throat> for us. Um, in order to address the needs, one of the pieces that the CNA process has allowed us to do is really take a closer look at the data and make better decisions in and around the data. We're also working on that data picture and building that data set um, Kathy's been working on it diligently. Um, <clears throat> these are the focus areas on the screen here where um, we addressed and prioritized and allocated resources. And when I talk about resources, it's current staffing, it's time, uh, but it's also funding in these areas to address these areas um, that were identified as areas for improvement as a result of the first round of the CNA. So the next round, we'll, we'll be honing in on those. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of a background on the ESSA funds. As you know, it is no longer No Child Left Behind. Um, it is now um, <coughs> ESSA. Um, but both federal pieces of legislation have the same policy goals around improving equity of access, improving outcomes for students, um, but also that strong state and local accountability systems that we still have a main state assessment. Uh, it's also around under helping and assisting identifying underperforming schools and also providing evidence-based interventions to support students and those schools. The difference is, is it's a little bit less prescriptive. For example, under No Child Left Behind, the goals were set at the federal level. Now we get to set those goals, and, and that's where the improvement piece. It also highlights certain areas needing increased attention. I'll talk about those as the titles and the funding sources um, when we talk about that in detail. But of course, with that increased flexibility comes some increased responsibility. We have more flexibility in terms of the accountability systems the state has. Um, they have decided to stick with the current testing system. Uh, we also have flexibility to set those targets uh, for improved student outcomes, and we can also select strategies that best meet our needs and our students' needs for interventions. But those responsibilities have increased. Um, one of the responsibilities is include more stakeholders, and that's the reason for the CNA community um, group. Um, a group of over um, 30, uh, but also we are also required to have a process in place for improvement planning, and that's where the data-wise piece has helped us out. And we have greater um, reporting responsibilities as well to the state and to the federal government. So there are, under ESSA, there are five titles, and basically a title is a source of federal funding that runs from the federal government through the state government. Title I is quite similar to what it was under No Child Left Behind, <clears throat> the focus is on proving the academic achievement um, of the disadvantaged, and it's really about identifying students who are at risk at, of failure and providing interventions <coughs> to those students. Title II <clears throat> is shifted a little bit. It's about preparing and training and recruiting highly qualified teachers, principals, and other school leaders. And then Title III, <coughs> excuse me, is around ELL and supporting ELL <coughs> learners. Title IV is a 21st century um, schools grant. I'll talk about that in more detail. And Title V is flexibility. It's the Rural Education Initiative. We um, receive funding from Title I, Title II, and Title IV. Title I-A is <clears throat> the funding is based on um, the percentage of students who receive free and reduced lunch. So we keep track of that monthly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Eights Corner School has been an ongoing recipient of that funding for quite some time. We do have requirements under that funding title. Um, we must provide services for neglected and homeless students, but also parent and family engagement requirements. It must be catchy, Leanne. Equitable services for private schools as well. And our um, private school <coughs> that receives funding is the Morrissey Center right here in Scarborough. So Title I funding, you can take a look at the funding over time, the last three years. You'll notice there's a bit of a trend in that funding. We basically spend majority of the Title I funding on salaries and benefits for staff to provide that additional support to students, but we also provide um, some supplies and some services as well. For Title IIA, the focus is on professional development for teachers and leaders. It's also based on free and reduced funding. <clears throat> what we use and the eligibility is determined by our focus areas <clears throat> and we really use that um, 
to focus that on professional development that our local funds can't provide. We have to allocate funding um, to support the quality and effectiveness of teachers, principals, and other school staff, but we also need to address the learning for all students. Title IIA, um, the funding here, the good news is it's increasing. Um, we had quite a step up um, between FY17 and 18, and then a slight step up for FY19. Um, the majority of that goes to um, supporting the cost of instructional coaching at the high school, and then we've also used that funding for contracted services to provide leadership coaching aligned to our focus areas to help us out specifically in the grading and reporting <coughs> area. But we also have private school obligations there. The private school obligations are about um, in hundreds of dollars, not necessarily thousands of dollars. So it's a very small amount. I think it was about $600 for Title II and about $800 for Title I. Uh, for Title IV, this is a relatively new um, <clears throat> title. Uh, again, based on percentage of students um, who qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, title IV is interesting in that the eligibility it has to be de is determined by our focus areas, but also we have to give high priority to those schools who have higher, um, high, uh, higher uh, free and reduced lunch numbers. And we have to allocate funding for one or more of these areas. Um, so well-rounded education, and those are areas like environmental education, music, arts. Uh, <clears throat> the list is rather long for those pieces. STEM, we've used it for STEM. Uh, world language instruction, uh, history, civics, government, geography, it, um, college career counseling, volunteerism in the community, integrating multiple disciplines, so it's pretty wide open there. Um, but then we also have to allocate funding for safe and healthy schools. And in that area, there are uh, two categories, safe and supportive schools. So the funding can go to things like preventing bullying and har har harassment, school dropout prevention, school readiness, but also student physical and mental health, substance abuse prevention, school violence prevention, nutritional education, trauma-informed classroom management, um, mentoring, school counseling, um, social-emotional learning, those kinds of um, activities. There's also effective use of technology, um, but that is not to exceed 15%. Um, we don't get a lot of money compared to the other titles in this area, um, uh, which is a challenge for us since there's such flexibility under this title. Uh, but we have used this funding in the first year, we used it to support the school gardens at Wentworth. Some of the funding went towards that, but also social emotional learning at the K-5. <clears throat> And this past year, we're using it to provide, we've split it, provide STEM supplies um, for the students in grades 6 through 12. Our visits in our schools, you saw some of those supplies in the middle school classrooms <coughs> around some of the Lego um, materials. And at the high school, it's supporting the technology classes. And they're also buying some of the similar kinds of equipment for our students. So in planning for um, FY20, uh, the timeline um, is set so that we can get input um, from community and staff. Uh, we're going to review our progress around our goals. We're we'll examine um, our focus areas, update those areas, um, and we're going to look at all the resources we have available to identify how we might want to best use the federal resources that come to us through the state. We're also going to take a look at our improvement process. Kathy and I, as we work together, always are thinking, all right, is this the best timeline for this, or is, this, is there a different timeline that might work better for us? And process as well. So coming back full circle, uh, we're going to be meeting with the Le Leadership Council to continue that work, uh, and then meet with the community, and then hopefully get back to you on June 20th. Um, it, we never know what our allocations are going to be for the coming year. Hopefully, we have meetings, uh, DOE meetings coming up next week, the week after, and sometimes we get a handle on some, maybe some preliminary numbers and allocations around which we can plan. Thank you. Thoughts, comments, questions? Um, <coughs> I have a couple questions just to clarify the titles mm -hmm. and how those work. Um, so I know you said, I, I know in the past, Eight Corners has been a, the only Title I school in the district. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the percentages of free and reduced lunch? Yes. Okay. So the, 
So how are other schools eligible for Title II and Title IV? I guess is my question. If that's also based on a on the percentage of free and reduced not lunch. as um, stringent a formula as Title One. Okay. For Title One funding, um, typically it's the highest the school with the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch numbers. But we, because our population is relatively small, it and they're very close between the schools, <coughs> it fluctuates year to year. So what we try and do is keep that consistent. We also try and keep it at the K-2 level so that we can be more preventative and proactive with our students rather than delivering <coughs> services later to students. So we've been trying to keep that at the K-2. For Title II and Title IV, there isn't a strict formula by which we need to go by. Um, they're just general to, guidelines. To qualify or to use the money? To use the money. Okay. To use the money. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Kathy, thank you both so much. Kathy, I have a question. Sure. Could you explain to the public how this impacts the budget? Sure. Do you, do you put estimates in the budget? Is this supplemental to the budget? <clears throat> uh, it is in addition to the budget. We are, um, there is a federal requirement that we cannot um, supplant the budget. It must be in addition to. So, for example, these are services in addition to what we offer, um, and that's why that well-rounded education piece, for example, we provide activities and things that the local budget, the local funding won't provide. We actually are required to describe how we allocate our funds across the schools so that it is equitable across the schools so that this is, these funds go above and beyond. And so just to clarify, we couldn't say, oh, well, we get a hundred and, I don't remember the exact number, $40,000 from Title IIA, so we don't need PD in our budget. We don't Correct. need professional development in our budget because that would be supplanting, and we're not allowed to do that, just in case that comes up for you guys. And there's criteria around that professional <clears throat> development. It needs, there are certain, it needs to be ongoing, it needs to be sustained, it needs to meet the standards for quality professional development, so we have to make sure we tick off all those boxes both in our application and in our reporting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Thanks, you. Monique. Great presentation, Kathy and Monique. Okay, um, moving on to 8.0, the chair's report. I thought long and hard um, about what I wanted to talk about, if you can click to the next slide, about what we were gonna talk about tonight from a chair's report and thought about all of the work that we've all done collectively um, from the administration to staff to the board in preparing for the budget. And it is probably the single most important thing that a board can do is advocate for a strong and reasonable budget. So I am turning everything over tonight on the chair's report to our finance committee to talk about that very topic. No pressure. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> so, thank you. So, um, this, I want to review sort of where everything, we've, what we've been doing since first reading. Um, that brings us to today, uh, fun animations, <laughs> and, and then what, what's going to happen between now and second reading. So this is just as much uh, an additional sort of channel communication for the public as it is for you guys in preparation for our workshop uh, on Monday. Um, so we've had uh, a lot of meetings. Um, over the course of the last 10 or so days, the Finance Committee have met with Kate and Julie and district leaders um, to ask some more questions and just to go through the line items um, in uh, probably a nauseating detail. Um, but we feel like we have a really good handle on it and want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable going into the workshop <coughs> on Monday. So what's happened um, between first reading and today, so let's just focus on on what we as a school board have done, um, not taking into consideration any factors with the, the council. Um, but some of the, the changes that we've already seen, so we've um, received some updated quotes and estimates, and I'm gonna cover just the highlights. There are more that we'll share with you guys over email probably tomorrow. Um, but some of the adjustments that we've already seen, um, we've seen a reduction in about $50,000 from the Chromebook estimates. Um, we've uh, as a finance committee, our, it's our recommendation that we'll defer um, some of the CIP costs 
for the sound system and the scoreboard in Plummer and the alumni gym. Um, and we're also moving the facilities truck from appropriated to finance, which uh, saves money on the tax request. Um, some items in motion, um, so down here at the bottom, so the Anthem premium uh, came in a little below what uh, we had Kate had originally budgeted for it, so that was about $16,000 in savings. And then the Delta premium um, also came in below a little less significant savings, but still savings nonetheless. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm um, carrying on so like I said we've met had uh, detailed conversations with Allison and um, Monique um, to understand sort of the impacts of both their departments we had a lot of questions not just from the finance committee but also ones that came from the community and the rest of the board and I think we've successfully had most of those answered um, to our satisfaction which has been great and we're really grateful for your extra time um, we have seen updated and we continue to see updated enrollment numbers. Julie will keep me honest here. Um, you know, the kindergarten registrations are trending towards our expected increased enrollment around 254. I don't know if you have another updated number from today. I don't. I know it changes. Yeah, I don't have actually it in front of me. I didn't bring that um, But trending <coughs> in that direction. Um, and as of uh, yesterday, um, there's 35 income, incoming kindergartners who um, have an individualized education plan. Um, I think Allison said as of yesterday, they're about halfway through those IEP meetings. Um, and so there is a possibility, if everything stays as is today, there is a possibility that based on those needs, we will be able to reduce one of the nine EdTech asks down to eight. Um, however, uh, the students of the out of district, we also are learning that the out of district tuition costs are going to increase. Um, and I, it's a pretty significant amount, um, anywhere from 60 to over $100,000 that could increase. So where we are seeing some savings, um, we're also seeing some, some increases um, coming already. Um, and we've made additions or adjustments to the budget based off the feedback that we've heard from the community as well as staff one of those being Unified Basketball, um, which is now back into the budget at a significantly reduced cost to $626. And that's... Oh. That's not the total cost. That is um, the amount that the budget will need to increase to fully support the program because um, our Director of Athletics, Mr. Legage, has applied for a grant for $2,500, um, which we're 99% sure we will get. Um, and we've also reallocated some professional development funding from the athletic budget toward this um, unified program. So that's additional funding that we need to. Stop me if you guys have questions. Or if you want to add anything. No, I would just maybe clarify that, because now I feel like we've gone all the way around, that it is a reduction of the original estimate of what we budgeted for. Yes, it's a significant reduction. We um, reprogrammed the proposal based on some different standards right. than what we currently, what we were using in the original proposal. Right. So the new, the new added investment to fund the program is six hundred and twenty-six dollars. Yes. Which is not the total cost of the program. No, that's what you're saying. Right up here. Right. But that's yes, that's the budget yeah. increase. <clears throat> Uh, so where to from here? So um, on Monday we have our budget workshop, joint workshop with town council. Um, the agenda and expectations for that meeting are that both uh, the school and the town will come to the table with their um, adjustments, whatever updates they have, um, given the direction that we had, which was 1.3 million overall. Um, we are continuing to believe that the budget that was put forward was responsible um, and it was done it was put together you know really thoughtfully uh, through the work of our uh, leaders um, and we'll continue to to support it considering being considerate of the ch changes that um, you know I just mentioned before and probably some more that will come over the next couple couple of days um, there's no action that will be taken at that meeting so that's strictly just a discussion based conversation that where the action is taken is on Wednesday night next Wednesday town council finance committee has a meeting 
and they'll decide what their recommendation will be to the town council, and then the town council at their second reading will decide whether or not they're going to make a specific appropriations to the town and the school. And at that point, we'll have 24 hours to turn around a second reading budget. Anything to add? No, that's April. That's good. Clear as mud. Julie, anything to add? Nope. Cool. And this is our um, plug for yes on municipal question one. So there's going to be two question ones, a municipal and a school referendum question one. The municipal question one is um, to get allow Scarborough to enter into the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, um, which would save us, which would bring an additional $83,000 in state funding. So that $83,000 is currently in the budget. We're being optimistic that the town is going to vote yes for that. If that is voted <coughs> down, that $83,000 comes out of the budget. And $83,000 is equivalent to roughly two FTEs in, in some cases. It could be two ed techs, including salary and benefits, one teacher, including salary and benefits, and then some. Yep. So. It's significant. Uh, just some additional resources. So um, Hillary created an awesome school budget FAQ that has gone out. That's published on our website. Um, it's also been on our school uh, social media sites. Um, and then the budget portal is where everyone can access budget information. And these are the additional meetings that I talked about. And I put that in there again. And I think it's somewhere else inside of <laughs> <laughs> subliminal messaging. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, oh, one other change that I hadn't noticed. Um, the student representative report is next. It's next in the slide deck, but if you want to follow the agenda, we, oh, can, sorry. we, can, yeah. okay. we can let that go. So Dylan, are we able to play this or no? I do not know. No, I don't think so. We can do it next meeting, I think. What, what we can also do um, is post it with the meeting materials, yeah. a link to it with the most meeting materials so that folks can access it. But why don't you give us a little yeah. a bit of what it is. Okay. So the, what the buddy system had prepared was a video kind of talking about what they would have said if, had they been able to come to the meeting tonight. But because they couldn't, they still really wanted to show you all what they do and all the fun activities they've done already. So they prepared a video. We'll hopefully, if we can't get it, well, we won't get it today. But we'll have it next meeting. You can't just if and it'll be posted <laughs> online. Um, they do a lot of work, and I thought they do a lot of work with the academic life skills program and functional life skills students to allow those who may not have We love the body system. <laughs> Hi. Only if you can read lips. <laughs> we love the body over here, so I thought maybe it would. Alright, sorry to interrupt. Alright, well that's too bad. Bummer. Anyway, um they they uh, allow or, oh, um, students who otherwise wouldn't have been able to attend certain different school-sponsored events uh, just because of any certain disability or like just it's not the safest of circumstances. Uh, all, a bunch of students who are mainstream, mainstream students uh, help by like going and basically participating in the events with them. Uh, I know last year they hosted a dance just for the students there, and I believe it was Disney themed. That was pretty cool. Um, and there's so much more on this video that you'll be able to see. But it's a really cool program. I thought it would be a great thing to show, especially after all the great stuff that we've finally been able to add in with Unified Basketball. It just kind of all adds up and really shows how equitable we're moving towards in our district. Um, following that, let's see. On April 10th, students at SMS had the opportunity to hear from four local entrepreneurs, uh, and each speaker just kind of talked about their journey 
with starting a business and the different paths to successful careers. Uh, this kind of adds into the difference between going to college and just going to like vocational and like their, the way you can be successful either way and showing all the different postgraduate career paths that can be offered. Um, this was a great night. I always try to talk about something musical because they're like every week in this district. Um, on April 23rd, they had their annual jazz night, the jazz band, both middle school and high school. I only have high school photos, unfortunately, because I forgot to take photos in the middle of the concert, too. I just got the beginning, but uh, it was a great concert. It, it was truly amazing to see how many students in middle school are moving up through into the jazz band to the high school, and it just goes to show how many more students are going to be participating throughout the next few years with the help of Ms. Shabo over at the middle school. And of course, there was a full crowd and lots of great music and snacks, and if you ever get a chance to go, I would highly recommend it. They're all dressed up, if you see. <laughs> um, I talk a lot about their fundraisers, but the reason why the softball team fundraises so much I think it's biannually, Mr. Gage is, okay. Biannually is because the softball team during April break every other year goes to uh, Disney World to compete in games and do training during their spring break. And I believe they played seven games. And also while they're there, of course, went to Disney World and had fun. And Disney does own ESPN, so they have the worldwide, uh, the World of Sports arena over there with all the different fields. and. It's just a really cool opportunity for students to go and experience a different arena with different schools from all over the country. And I just, off, it's a great opportunity to go to Disney too, you know, like, <laughs> the student doesn't want to go to Disney. a big Disney fan. <laughs> um, and then... The, the one thing I would add, Dylan, I think oh. they actually played eight games, eight games. And it's also, I think it... It's such a critical opportunity for them to really build relationships with one another. And um, all, I mean, you see this with all of our teams, but this, I feel like our girls softball team really stands out in terms of the culture that um, Coach Griffin and his assistant coaches create. They have meals together. That, I mean, you can tell when you watch these girls play, they, they genuinely care about each other in a really deep, authentic way. Um, and I think that this trip plays a critical role in that. And, and sort of setting the season, the tone for the season in that way. Yeah, and just to add to that a little bit too, it, besides just this one sports team, if you were to look at any other sports team, I know like the swim team still meets every Friday for a movie night and like all sorts of different teams are like their own family, mm -hmm. even when they're out, out of season. And so you, like, if you ever get a chance to see them when they're not playing a game, they're never actually away from each other. They're always on <laughs> one of the team. Um, it's pretty awesome how close they all are. <laughs> so on April 30th, which I believe was Tuesday, um, the middle school librarians held a Battle of the Books tournament um, where students formed teams and they became experts on selected books, which are from the main student book award list. Um, these teams competed against each other with rounds of questions about their books and 30 students participated from grades 6, 7th, and 8th. And also, as you can see from the pictures, um, April was Book Spine Poetry Month, if any of you weren't aware. Um, the middle school library held a competition for the be best book spine poetry. Um, these are some of my favorites, so it works that you just kind of read the titles of the books down the line, and it creates short little poems. Cool. Um, before April break, the middle school and high school students watched the documentary Like, um, which addresses a bunch of the dangerous effects of social media on mental health. And it brought attention to the current addiction that many teenagers, including myself and <laughs> probably Dylan, have to our phones. Um, it was a great documentary about a super important topic. And then yesterday, the primary schools and Wentworth School participated in ACES Day, which stands for all children exercising simultaneously. Um, the different schools came to the high school and ran around the track and just kind of spent some nice time outside being active. Um, this is a nationwide movement that promotes healthy lifestyles for uh, students as they go get older. Um, and from what I could see outside of the cafeteria window, it looked pretty fun. <laughs>
Um, and then recently, Junior Achievement visited the primary schools. Junior Achievement is an organization um, that teaches programs and informs kids, students, about basic financial literacy for their future. Um, in the primary schools, they discuss wants, needs, and important job skills. Can I ask a question about the documentary? Mm -hmm. how, did, how did the students receive that? So I don't know how the middle school received it, but we had during our AE time, um, they brought us down to the auditorium and played the documentary down there. No, I mean like how, like, oh, did it like how, how what did kind it of, an, sorry, what kind of an impact did it have? Um, I mean, um, I thought it was very impactful. It definitely made me more aware of like how social media is negatively affecting us. They talked a lot about um, you know, how like how many likes you get on an Instagram picture and how that like people think that defines them mm -hmm. and a, a bunch of other ways that um, like social media companies such as Snapchat are making how they're <laughs> changing their company so that kids will be more like addicted to the app mm -hmm. and will go on it more and how it just is a very addictive social media <laughs> is super addictive. Well so I thought it was very interesting and a bunch of my peers, I think it was very impactful for all of us. Kristen, do you have any ideas, not to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. or maybe you and Dylan could think about this and talk with some of your, your friends about it or your peers about it? Like, how do we continue this conversation? Because it really, if it, between social media and jeweling and, you know, Companies really are targeting you, are targeting our kids, our teens, and I, we say teens, but it's not even teens because it's starting younger and younger um, in the middle school and even at Wentworth in some cases. How do, like, what can we do to be really relevant and have these conversations in a way that are going to resonate with you all um, and help you want to change your behaviors or help us think differently about the supports we provide that might help you? Well, I think this documentary was like a great start because. I know with that we've seen documentaries in the past that don't always accurately address the problems that like teenagers are facing, right. but I definitely thought this one was very relevant, um, and it felt like they actually understood what teenagers go through when they go on social media and stuff like that. So I feel like um, just spreading awareness and showing more documentaries and even integrating this kind of learning into the classroom, I think, would help. And Dylan, as the club network coordinator for the next few weeks. Um, do you think that there's a good alignment or fit with one of our existing clubs that might want to continue the conversation or help? I don't know if there's any specific club that would kind of align with this specifically. I mean, like service clubs would probably be the best one to look at just because those have already such a high participation rate. I think that to make the biggest impact, you just gotta start as young as they come. So before they're using it, teach them how to use it. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of like how we do with like technology at the school. Yeah. You just, mm -hmm. like we give them a laptop at K2, but they don't take it home yet. You teach them how to use it before they can start using it. And right. I think that it'll just prepare them more. I mean, asking a student to change when they're like 17, 18 years old is, like speaking to a wall, nothing's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I think it's like, as if you integrate it as part of their life as they move forward, they're gonna be more likely to just know from past experiences and hearing, hearing from people too. Like, I know it's probably helpful when people, like students from older grades would come down and talk to them about it too. Mm -hmm. Like having those, what are they called, cross, Great district. Yeah, cross phase level. Yeah, yeah. that cross phase level like mm -hmm. discussions and kind of honing in on what you're trying to get across. Great. Thank yeah. you. Have you scheduled anything at, at school to discuss it? Are there any time during advisory? I so I think that was one of the goals of the advisory period was to over time create more opportunities for those types of discussions. Mm -hmm. But where it's still kind of new, they're still trying to figure out what the best fit for scheduling those are. And they've done a really good job of trying to offer more like mindfulness activities and wellness activities to really, like right after, um, oh, what was it? I don't know, there was last year with 
like one of the walkouts, there was one, one of the opportunities students had were to go just have a discussion about it. And there's also weekly yoga and just different things that they're trying to implement. So I think over time, those are gonna be a much more important piece to include. Mm -hmm. You just have to get students on board with doing it first, which is why I think it's so important that crew with middle school is happening, where mm -hmm. if students are used to it, it won't be like you're trying to change their schedule, you're just trying to encourage them to learn more while they can have that free time. What kind of what kind of follow up did you have after the movie? I don't think there was too much of a follow up. It was pretty. I don't know exactly what day we watched it, but it was pretty close to April break, so yeah. I feel like there wasn't a ton of time um, to have kind of a yeah. follow up conversation. Did you guys do the something different at the middle school, Diane, that you could share? Would you mind going to them? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Diane really was the one who brought the like documentary to leadership and said this is a really relevant film that I think we should all look at. So the way we organized it at the middle school was we had our sixth and seventh graders watch it together, and then we had eighth graders watch it um, themselves as a grade level. Um, part of that was just in terms of Structurally, we could only seat so many students in the Homer Auditorium, and so as we thought about what two groups would we pair together, we really felt like it was most appropriate for the eighth graders to have their own showing. Um, and then our advisors for crew had shown a snippet of the trailer to students before they had seen the documentary so that it would stimulate some pre-discussion and then looped back. Um, the next advisory after. So again, I think it's just how do we keep putting that messaging out there so mm -hmm. that we grow awareness, we make people more mindful and deliberate and self-aware. Um, I know that even in talking with a lot of our teachers at the middle school who watched the documentary, there were so many takeaways, even for adults, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> about how do we use technology and how do we become more self-aware and more fully present um, in situations? Because the technology makes it too easy for us not to be. Was there a cost associated with showing that? There was. Um, so um, we bought uh, like a five showing license um, and Monique helped to cover the cost of that through curriculum funds. And um, Sue and I had coordinated uh, what would be the best time because when you buy the licensing, it's for five showings and you have to show it within five days. Um, that's the way um, that Indie Flicks works. And so um, we had shared the licensing on that and then they were kind enough to allow us to go to the high school for our students to view it in a comfortable space. So it's all used up. So it got all used okay. up. <laughs> it did. So, but I think, you know, um, it cost us just under $1,000 for five viewings for, um, I'm assuming probably all of our students, grades six through 12. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, at the end of the day, money really well spent, if you think about what was the per pupil cost for viewing that. They've done another one called Angst that yeah. is very powerful and it really addresses the, um, the issue of anxiety amongst our students. It's very, very well done. I think um, Empower Me, that the community group mm -hmm. showed yes. that a few years ago, didn't mm -hmm. they? I believe um, you're correct. That, but yeah, I think it's one that could be shown again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. So. Do you know what the turnout for the community showing was? I do not because I wasn't here. Um, when they had the community showing, but I know that we had heavily advertised it. Um, it was interesting because as we were solidifying dates with IndieFlix for our school showings, um, one of the pieces that we were committed to doing was having a community showing, and the folks from IndieFlix said, oh, 
this group, Empower Me, has already contacted us and they have a date set up that they're going to be showing it in your community. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of neat that we were all thinking in the same direction about the value of this mm -hmm. um, for the community. And so it was neat that our students had a chance to view it. Um, and then it was shown in the community, right? Like kids saw it before break and then it got showed um, right after break for parents. And so I'm hopeful um, and certainly encouraged our parents to go so that they could have full conversations um, mm -hmm. with the kiddos knowing that they had seen it as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Ten point oh committee reports. Communications. Um, okay. So communications has been focused pretty heavily on the budget. Um, we all we did our spotlight award at our last meeting, um, and if you haven't seen the video that we made um, celebrating David O'Connor, one of our high school students, um, you should go Teachers. check. Teacher. I mean, students. <laughs> Teachers. And in my head, I was going to say he was nominated by students. Um, you should go. I think it's on our website and our social media. Um, so you should go check that out. And a lot of the students were there, so that was really um, unique and special. Um, so aside from that, um, we've been working on a lot of the budget things. We are working on a newsletter um, similar to what we do for the district newsletter, um, and, but it'll be a budget edition just to get like um, the basics out there to people who might not see it on the budget portal or um, on, uh, go out and find it for themselves. Um, we're also working on some social media posts that will have that same information along with meeting reminders for a lot of the things that Sarah had mentioned previously in the finance report. Um, and also I should have added like voting dates, um, early voting and the um, June 11. 11. <laughs> um, the June 11th referendum. And we also are working hard to get some of the GSEA information out there, which stands for the Greater, Greater Sebago Education Alliance, um, which, <laughs> yes for it. Um, <laughs> again, this is this is the same information we had out that last year. We just are trying to clarify it for the community. Um, it will be on the municipal ballot as question one. Um, and again, it is um, asking if the community will vote to allow us to join the Educational Alliance, um, which will save us money in shared services and also bring in an additional $83,000 um, worth of state funding. And just to clarify, the school, um, the school referendum question one will be: Do you favor the school budget? So easy to remember. Question yes. one. Yes. 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 I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. I said it. as long as it's not. <laughs> paid publication. Uh, can I add one thing, Hillary? Yes. Please. It's that. Um, Chief Thurlow has generously offered to give us his in the know section oh, yeah. in the Scarborough Leader oh, for um, the edition that will come out the week of May 13th. Um, and we plan to use that section to dedicate it to information about the GSEA to get that information out into the community. So look for that in the Leader. That's great. So is that due tomorrow? I don't think it's due. You know, yeah, it's whatever our internal deadline was Monday, May 13th. So oh, we're okay. okay. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. Curriculum. Um, so today we had a super fun day. Um, I know Joanne's going to yell at me for using fonts that are hard to read, but um, <laughs> I just like, they look nicer. Um, anyway, today, so I just want to say thank you to Julie and Monique and the principals at all our schools um, who, or the administration actually, I should say, at all our schools, who um, planned for the members of the curriculum committee and other school board members to do a walkthrough at each of the schools. Um, we have the first three schools, two, okay, almost, yeah, so three weeks ago. Um, and then today was, which is why I'm talking because I've been walking through school since 7.30. Um, today we had our final day where... <laughs> Look at the administrators. <laughs> all like, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, we walked. We had the middle school this morning, and then we um, um, popped over to Wentworth, and then finally we had Blue Point. So um, after today, we've been to all six of our district schools, um, and I just put that it was the cutest classroom there. Um, the kids had worked on making the chains, and then they made it into a big rainbow around there room um, that was at Wentworth um, and so uh, it really was helpful for us um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us were able to go to at least one of the schools um, but what was really special for us was that it allowed us you know you guys tell us about all these things that are going on and we hear about them um, but it really allowed us to go in and see it in action with like actual kids doing all of this work and um, it was really energizing and I think um, helpful to us as to be informative as we make some of these decisions at, at like the higher level. Um, is that, I don't know how to do that. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, and also the the idea that curriculum isn't just a, a book that you use anymore. And it's really, I think, as I've been learning more and more about it, it's basically all the teaching and learning that happens in the schools. Um, and to be able to see that firsthand and actually participate in a lot of it, I mean, we jumped right in for a lot of it. Um, and it was just, it was fun and informative. And um, our second benefit, which was one of our goals, was that we got to lot, um, we got to meet a lot of the teachers and staff and students face to face and, and talk to them and just say hi or answer questions or whatever it was. Um, so, this, no, I'm not done, Julie. Oh, I done? was just going to say, when Hillary said, <laughs> like, jump, when Hillary said jump right in, she literally <laughs> jumped right in. She did the crab walk today, <laughs> a backwards baby crawl. She participated in first I grade I participated gym. in the first grade gym class. <laughs> Full on participation. Full on. And Including grade, and a refresher like, on your healthy food groups. Yeah. <laughs> Which actually has changed significantly since I learned about the food groups. So that, was, that was a good, was a good <laughs> informational session for me. Um, so this, these are our middle school tour guides, Ben and Shruti, um, with us at the, before they, actually no, this was at the end of their tour. Um, so a lot of the schools had student-led tours, um, and they just did such an amazing job. Um, going through these guys are middle schoolers obviously so they were able to answer our questions um, they were able to you know they really were they were really good tour guys they took us all over they gave us a really good feel for what the school was like and then we were able to break off into groups after that and go visit some individual um, classes and there's Mrs. Neto hiding in the back um, and then here's Greta our first tour guide at Wentworth of oh my gosh how many did we have Kelly we <laughs> Went, if, I, I just want to say, you, Wentworth had eight tour guides, and they were all stationed. They had their, like, spot that they went to at the beginning. They were all stationed at different points in the school, and we were, like, shuffled from one to the next. And the, this tour guide told us, Greta told us, okay, you're moving on to this. Who was next? I don't remember. Kelly at the clay. Yep, Kelly at the clay. And, um, and, and they each had made their own speech mm -hmm. about what they thought was important for us to know at Wentworth and either had memorized it or read it to us. Um, Mrs. Crosby told them to dress for success because they were going to be um, showing the school board around and we did have a full suit and tie. <laughs> um, it, was, it was really, really, really amazing. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Well, the, um, the pride that the students exhibited when they were talking about their school was so just, it was just really inspiring. Yeah. It was very, very powerful. They love their school and take great pride yeah. in it. Well, and not just Wentworth, all of them. That's what I mean, yeah. like all, all three. I mean, they, they loved their school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these guys actually said, we were so excited for this. <laughs> they were really excited. <laughs> um, these are our Blue Point tour guides um, with, uh, actually, so Julie and Monique um, came to, I think, all of the schools with us. Um, and then there's Mrs. Martin way in the back there. Um, so those were our tour guides for Blue Point. They brought us around. And then we also had the opportunity there to go in and see some things in action. And I just thought it would be cute to see the little pictures of them. So fun. 
So just a, um, not really an update, but just an acknowledgement that the school board is currently in teacher contract negotiations with the Skyro Educational Association, and that it's a confidential process, nothing to share, but updates will be provided when appropriate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a theme here. Mm -hmm. That's the last slide. That's the last That's it. Okay. And then um, for policy, nope. <laughs> just things that we're working on. Um, we're very busy. Agenda planning uh, policy BEDB is under review, as well as our wellness policy JLAA. And on deck, um, we've heard a lot tonight about social media and communications, and just making sure that we've got policies that are relevant um, on the books. So we're starting those next, along with our school resource officer MLU. And our next meeting is May 29th at 4.30 in the central office. Can I ask a clarification question? Of course. When you say under review, does that mean it has been sent to the lawyers? Um, or under review internally amongst you both, guys? Both, actually. Okay. Um, agenda planning has been to the attorneys and has come back. Okay. Um, we just figured that with two very mm -hmm. weighty first readings, we were going to hold one. Yep. Um, wellness, we kicked off. And that should be going to... Um, the attorneys for review probably after that next meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm like, great.